Casey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. So before we got to this segment, I, I spent a ton of time just going over Red, White, and Royal Blue as being like one of the best things I've read this year and like one of my top books, like maybe in the ever category because it's just <laughs> it's everything I needed in a romance with the the prince trope and essentially royalty in the U.S. with the first son. And I mean, Alex and Henry are so awesome. Tell us what your inspiration was behind this book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I first started, actually, it's weird. Um, a couple days ago, I was like going through my time hop, which shows you, you know, what you tweeted like two, three, four years ago. And I realized that like a few days ago, which is April 13th, um, was the day that I tweeted like, Hey, I just had this idea for a book. Um, and, uh, it was like, took me back to that moment of like the exact like lightning strike moment when I, I knew what I wanted to write. Um, and this is like a question we'll get into later, but it was like one of many attempts at a book I had started and none of them had really like taken hold of me like this one did. So it, it was, early 2016, I was obsessively following the presidential election, um, which, uh, you know, we all were at the time with a lot of optimism. And, uh, and at the same time, I was reading two books. Uh, I was reading The Royal We, which is um, by um, Heather Morgan and Jessica Cox. And it's about, uh, it's basically like almost a novelization of Will and Kate with like a bunch of like different things changed about it. Um, so I was reading that and I was also reading a super dry Carl Bernstein, Hillary Clinton biography, um, which was like a fun little juxtaposition. And I had this idea in my head of like, I want to do like, I f- I've seen so many subversions of Prince Charming trope, but I feel like as a queer person, I've never seen the one that seems the most obvious to me, which is, you know, like what if like he wasn't the perfect, like going to produce a million heirs Prince, you know? Um, and then on the other side, I was like, I, like, I loved, um, like chasing Liberty when I was growing up and like my date with the president's daughter. And I was like really into the idea of a a rom-com starring this like rebellious first kid. And I couldn't decide which one I wanted to do first. And I was like, wait a minute, if I put them both in the same story, I don't have to pick. (laughs) So, uh, honestly, it was me being indecisive (laughs) that led to that decision. Um, and like on a, a wider scale, like a bigger scope, I just like really was looking for the perfect, like fun escapist tropey rom-com that was like so undeniably fun that like the fact that it was also queer wouldn't keep it out of the mainstream, you know? Um, cause a big thing that I want to do as an author and as a queer person is like push those stories into the mainstream and be like, Hey, you know, like 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 everybody it's kind of like what they say in love i mean like everybody deserves to have a great love story you know Mm -hmm. um and so everybody deserves to have like a big shiny tropey fun rom-com you know so yeah that was kind of where it came from for me and there is so much rom-commy goodness like floating in this book (laughs) i think you like pulled (laughs) a little bit from everything yeah yeah. Without giving spoilers, because there could be some, depending on what you pick for this, is is there like mm-hmm. one of the rom com moments that just sticks out for you as like one of your favorites among all of them? Hmm. I mean, like, wow, that's a good question. Um, I have pulled so many tropes from so many of my different favorite rom coms, but um, there's like this one thing that I love in every rom-com, which is like the gratuitous karaoke moment, um, which uh, is actually, if you've ever watched Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is like a song on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, yeah. like singing up. <laughs> yeah. That, so it's like, like 27 dresses does it. And like 10 things I hate about you does it where it's like somebody gets up and sings a song in front of a bunch of people for no reason. And it's like, no, like this doesn't happen in real life, but it's super fun. And so like writing the whole karaoke scene, which I don't think is a spoiler. Um, that was like so much fun for me because I was like, you know, I was a musical theater kid in high school, you know, we all were. And, um, and so that was just like, I got to be so indulgent with that. And it was such a blast. I loved it. I, I think you picked a great one right there. Cause you're right. <laughs> there is that moment. There's even that movie. 
which of course I'm blanking out on right now. That was like the it was the Revel Wilson movie earlier, mm-hmm. I think this year, that yeah. she's like, there's always the karaoke moment that she ends up trapped in the karaoke moment in her yeah, own little yeah. thing, I, right? I love the karaoke moment. <laughs> that says a lot about people, the songs they pick. It does. It is like character shorthand for sure. Yeah. Like when like B gets up and sings Call Me by Blondie in the book, I'm like, this is what she's about, you know? <laughs> yeah. There have been so many accolades on this book before it even got published. I mean, we were reading about it, I think, in Blush almost two months ago now. Mm-hmm. What's resonating so much with all these pre-readers? God, you know, I mean, just to start off, I've been, like, completely blown away by the response to it. Um, like, when I wrote this book, I was like, this is so niche. It's like a politi- queer political rom-com with royal elements And also we talk about like gerrymandering in it. And it's just like, I was like, this is so niche. Like no one's going to care. No one's going to publish it. I was like, I'm going to try and query this for like a month. And then like, I'm just going to self pub, you know? Um, And the fact that people have engaged with it so much and that it has gotten like, I mean, I think three star reviews now, which is just like blowing my mind completely, like so beyond grateful for those. Um, It's just been so like staggering and (laughs) incredible. Um, But I don't know. I think that right now the world is really depressing. Like we live in a world right now that is like at times literally on fire, you know, and uh, it is so important to have like these like little like oases or like moments of respite um, and like little escapist things. Because like when I first started writing this book, I was so like neck deep in the news cycle and I really couldn't finish it until I, pulled out of it because I realized like that wasn't what it needed to be. Like it didn't need to be mired in all of the negativity and all of the darkness of what's going on in the world. It needed to be this like spark of hope, you know, um, that would kind of feel like, like I think about when Obama won reelection in 2012 and like I was with my friends, I was in college at the time and we like went out on the balcony and like popped a bottle of like $60 French champagne and like how I think about like how I felt in that moment. And I was like, I want this book to feel like that moment, you know? Um, and I think that a lot of people have been missing that feeling. I think that we have so few things, like, especially when we look at the political sphere right now to be excited about and to be hopeful about. And, um, I think that we're all just like nostalgic almost for when we had hope. And I think that like, um, what this book does is it lives in the space of like being here and now and still having hope, you know? Um, and I think that's really resonating with people. And then I also think that people are just like excited to see, we're seeing it with like Helen Huang and like Jasmine Guillory who are writing romances that are integrating like, you know, neurodiverse characters and just like racially diverse characters. I think a lot of people are tired of seeing, you know, the same like two straight white cisgender, like neurotypical people falling in love, you know? Um, and so I think that people are hungry for something that's different in rom-com and that, um, that can show that like different types of people can have that same big, huge escapist magical love story. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where I think it comes from. You noted that you started writing this in 2016, essentially before the election happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think you would have written the same book had Hillary won? That was a great question. <laughs> and um, the book I had, plan to write um before the election went the way that it did was a different book um there were like so many threads that like I ended up dropping I at one point had was before anything about like Russia had come out I like at one point had like there's like a Russian double agent involved in the campaign and I was like this is too unrealistic no one's gonna buy this I'm cutting this (laughs) you know and now I'm like god (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah I mean it definitely I think it would have been more um like lampooning like the Democratic Party not that I have anything against Democratic Party as someone who like is registered as Democrat but but it would have been more of like Veep style like Mm -hmm. you know um like we know that we're all on the same side here so like we're gonna send each other up kind of thing um and it instead is more of like it's still very tongue-in-cheek and it's still very like has that that veep side to it but um it needed to have more of like it needs to be less cynical basically 
you know, because I don't think that we can really afford a lot of cynicism right now um, beyond like, you know, what, you know, roasting the president on Twitter is cynical, I guess. But, but, um, but yeah, I think that there are certain things that happen in the plot that, um, you know, never probably would have been explored uh, if, if the results of the election had gone differently, because there, I don't think I would have felt as much of an urgency to put those into the story, you know? Um, so yeah, it definitely would have been different. It definitely yeah. would have been a lot different, but the president was always the same. It was always like the, like president Claremont was the same character from the moment I came up with the idea for the book. She's just like, um, she's like Tammy Taylor from Friday night lights meets Wendy Davis, the politician from Texas meets um like a tiny bit of selena meyer from veep um and probably like some of like every strong female in my life you mm-hmm. know um but yeah long story short yes it would have been different sorry i talk too much you can cut this no down. no you're 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 doing great i promise <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, <great. laughs> one of the things i like about it so much and you touched on this a little bit is that it's not two white guys getting together mm-hmm. because Alex is Mexican American. Uh, mm-hmm. And certainly, given how things have played out under the current administration, having that element in the White House as first son yeah. it says a lot. And Alex comments on this, you know, periodically as he's kind of going through things and how that yeah. aspect of his heritage plays into things. Did you have that set early on or did that kind of manifest as we saw how immigrants were being treated post-election and even during the election cycle for that matter? Sure, sure. Well, the minute it kind of was like the plot itself that informed what Alex would be because, like I said, the first character I came up with was the president and everything kind of formed around her. Um, And I'm from Louisiana and I have this huge chip on my shoulder about Democrats and liberal people and progressive people in red states because like I was one for so long I live in like a purpley state now um but uh but you know I feel like they're so often written off and discredited and like I can't tell you I could probably count on one hand the number of like actual like presidential candidates who came and campaigned in my hometown which is the capital of Louisiana you know um and you know people just don't see anything worth investing in so I wanted to do a Southern Democrat. Um, I didn't think that a Louisiana Democrat was that realistic. So I did a Texas Democrat. And um, I, for the minute I knew she was from Texas, I was like, well, it would make sense for her to have like married a Mexican man or like a, you know, like a first or second generation Mexican man. Um, And it just kind of went from there where I was like, you know, I really do like that idea of that. Like there's, I know I spent so much time in Texas. I know so many people from Texas. I know so many like Tejanos and like, you know, people, like it just made sense to me. And then, you know, the more that the rhetoric kind of got really vitriolic about, um, about Mexican immigrants um, around that election. I was like, yeah, fuck you. Actually, I am going to put some Mexican people in the white house. So, um, yeah. That's what's going to happen. And, um, yeah and there were i did as much as i could with it like obviously i'm white um and i did a ton of research i talked to a ton of like mexican friends of mine and like especially like tejano like um like first or second generation people and um and then what i'm really excited about with the movie is that um, we have the opportunity to bring in more people on the creative side who are latino who can offer more of that voice that can go farther than i could go with it you know, and that can explore more things with it. Um, so yeah, I, it just felt really natural to me. Like he's from Texas, like, of course, like he could be half Mexican, you know, Mm -hmm. that's just like so typical there. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very natural progression of the character for me. And in a weird twist, I'm actually interviewing you from Dallas. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Matt, that's so funny. Um, yeah, I feel like that's appropriate. I feel like the stars aligned to have you interview me from Texas. <laughs> and finish the book while I'm in Texas. It yeah, was kind of crazy. It's so appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really excited because my second tour stop is in Austin and I am like so excited. I haven't been to Austin in like a year or two. Um, and it just like feels so right to go back with this book. So I'm like so excited. There is a ton of 
history in this book. Mm-hmm. Henry goes into a lot of history of the monarchy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I, I loved is in the emails that Alex and Henry are trading, they end mm-hmm. up in quote a lot of literature or other letters of historical people. How much of that was in your head and how much was I need to go off and do a ton of research? Mm -hmm. Um, So like for me, like a lot of like when I was talking about like, like there's parts where like after Alex starts to figure himself out, he starts to like do all this independent research of like, let me like remediate myself on like, like queer American history and like, you know, reconnect with it, which I think is something that a lot of like queer people in their twenties do. Um, uh, like when, especially like for me, like when I was like 20, 21 and I started to like figure myself out, I was like, wow, I need to know like the first thing about like my own community, you know? And so I, um, and so I went back and like really like read a lot and like educated myself. And so, um, a lot of the American history, like American queer history was stuff I was already familiar with, um, because that's, you know, something that I felt was my responsibility to learn in the past. Um, but yeah, I definitely didn't know a lot about queer British history, like at all. Um, and so that was a lot of reading for me. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, like finding like history threads on Twitter and then like, okay, I'm going to go look up all these stories individually and like find out like what, like like, what's the real truth because, you know, like things get twisted online. Um, but yeah, I, the letters were kind of started with, um, and this is like, gonna like date when I started writing this but I was like really coming off the Hamilton high you know um which I think we all were in early 2016 it was just like like, this was like oh man like I've been like mainlining like Alexander Hamilton history for like six months you know um and and uh you know I was really interested like I loved like all of Hamilton's love letters with Eliza but like there was like also his letters with Florence that were really fascinating to me and I had started looking into that, and that was how I found um, this book called My Dear Boy by Richter Norton. And um, that was, like, I found that because I was, like, researching, like, the Hamilton Lawrence letters. And um, and that was where I found a lot of the letters that are featured in the emails. And then I also was, like, looking into, like, Virginia Woolf and, like, Eleanor Roosevelt and all of those figures from history who also have a lot of archived letters that are very, like, hmm, interesting. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it was like, honestly, it was like almost, it was, I had a blast with it because it was just like a queer history, like Easter egg hunt. Um, and I, you know, I, I intentionally did that in the book because I pictured this book, I picture it being something that like a lot of people at different points in their journey with queerness would read. And I would want like, like, let's say it's like, you know, like some like 19 year old who's like just figuring things out and like, they don't really know anything about queer history i'm like well here's like the name of something that you should go look up like here's paris is burning like go watch it you know kind of thing um and so it was it's really like a bunch of sneaky history lessons because <laughs> i'm a nerd and i was like you should know this too <laughs> um but yeah i had a blast doing that um and then just like research in general was just like so much fun like i spent so much time pouring through the royal collection archives online just like for throwaway jokes and stuff like that um it was just I'm, I was a journalist for six years before I like quit to do this full time. And so, yeah, I'm a huge nerd and I love like, like historical context for everything. Um, because that's just like what I've been wired to do for so long. So yeah, uh, that's kind of where it all came, comes from for me. And and my musical theater geek self loves that Hamilton had a play in that. Cause I kind of felt as I was reading some of it's like, this seems very Hamilton in some way oh, yeah. that they're using this. I like so battled with myself over like whether Hamilton was a thing that existed in this universe. And like, if I should mention it in the book and I was like, I'm not gonna, because it's like still such, it's still so fresh that I feel like it's going to date the book a lot. But, um, but like, it's definitely like, there's this like undercurrent of like, Oh, like we're like doing <laughs> like colonial rap battles under the text, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things I like about this so much is that it is current revisionist history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause I mean, most of it, and, and this doesn't get to a spoiler, most of it is leading into the 2020 mm-hmm. election with Claremont being president in the here and now and having succeeded yeah. from Obama. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's current revisionist history. It's very interesting how that plays <laughs> itself out. Yeah. 
now I, I think we mentioned that this is this is your first book that's yeah. that's out there in the world. What got you into writing romance and specifically MM romance? Um, I mean, I have always consumed like all types of media, and like this is going to be this is like my one sacrilegious answer that I give in interviews, which is I'm really more into movies and TV than I am into books. And that is like the most media that I consume. It's not what I write. It's not, like, I'm not a screenwriter. I'm not good at that type of writing. Um, but um, it is where I pull most of my influences from and what I consumed the most as a kid. I mean, unless you count like Harry Potter, which like everybody read. Um, which does and, very much exist in the red, white, and royal blue universe, which oh, I also yeah, love. Very much so. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. Um, but, but what I engaged with about all of those things was all these new relationships in them. Like I watched Lost and I was like, I don't care about Dharma or the clues or like what this island actually means to the polar bears. Like I care about like that everybody's going to end up together that I want to end up together in the end, you know? And it was, um, it was always like that with everything I watched. Like I've watched Buffy and it was like always about that for me. It was like, this is cool. Mythology is cool, whatever, but like Spike, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, uh, it really, you know, like that was just what grabbed me. And so I knew that was what I was always going to want to write. And I tried to write other genres. Every other book I tried to start writing was like young adult magical realism or young adult fantasy, which is like clearly not my genre. <laughs> and um, I tried like a bunch of different false starts in those, in those genres. Uh, and it didn't pan out for me. Um, and then, and this was, like I said, like the first time I had an idea that completely grabbed me. Um and I think, like, like I said earlier, like, I I think I gravitate to writing queer fiction for the same reason that straight people gravitate to writing straight fiction, which is that I'm a queer person. And I, it's my experience. It's what I know. Um, I didn't really come into this book with an idea of, like, what the gender should be more than, like, what the story would be. And it formed around that because I, like, I didn't think that this story would take on all of the same <laughs> qualities if it was like two women you know I thought that it would be a little different tone like I felt like if it was like two women there would be like a porn parody within like 15 minutes of it coming out you know um and so it's just like it's there's just different ways that like like lesbian couples and, and gay men couples are perceived by the world I felt um and I I felt that for this story it made more sense with two men and I also wanted to do that like prince charming trope subversion um and so it just kind of told me what it wanted to be, you know? And, um, but my next book is, uh, it's about two women and, um, it's a completely different story. Like it's completely different. Um, and so, yeah, I really, um, honestly, it's just, it's just me trying to make queer rom-coms a mainstream thing more than anything else. More power to you. And so far it looks like you're doing a great job with that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, uh, this question may not have a good answer based on what you just told us about your your mm -hmm. kind of TV and movie thing, but are there authors who influence you? Well, yeah. I mean, like, there are definitely authors that influence me. Um, I loved Oscar Wilde growing up, which is, like, you know, I was, like, 15, like, at, like, my sister's... I remember, like, being at my sister's college graduation with, like, a highlighter and sticky tabs going through the importance of being earnest, like, you <laughs> with a paperback. And, um... And that, so like, yeah, I did like my term paper in high school and picture Dory Gray. And I was like, this is straight behavior. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, Oscar Wilde was a huge influence on me. I mean, like the Harry Potter books, like, yes, of course, like they influenced me. Um, I, um, I read a lot of nonfiction, a lot of memoirs actually, um, cause I love the voice of them. And I think that's what like helps me to have a good like narrative voice. So I love like Carrie Fisher's writings. I love um, like Nora Ephron's memoirs are all incredible. Mary Carr. Um, let's see what else. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. And I'm like, oh, what else do I read? Um, Jane Austen, honestly, <laughs> like the classics of romance, you know. Um, and then like more recently, like my favorite author right now is Taylor Jenkins Reid. Um, like Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is like, my favorite book I've read in the past couple of years and definitely has like earned a spot on like my all time faves shelf. Um, and so that's definitely, and I love how she does a lot of, she like, like me does a lot of um, what we call in journalism, alternate story formats. Um, so like, like epistolary style 
things that are threaded into the book, which is something that obviously I really love too. Um, and then, yeah, that's, I mean, like I read a lot of, like I said, I read a lot of nonfiction. So like Rebecca Traster and like Roxanne Gay, like, um, uh, yeah, I mean, like those are, those are all my faves, but then like, yeah, I pull from a lot of, um, a lot of TV and movies. Like the biggest influences on this were like Veep, Parks and Rec, um, uh, there's like this web series called the gay and wondrous life of Caleb Gallo, um, that I love. And it's like, so like millennial absurdity that it really kind of like, like there's like a shout out to it in the book. Cause they play the song, uh, Loco and Acapulco by the four tops in that show. And I, I put that in the book. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, I'm kind of all over the place. I have a lot of like influences and, um, and a lot of things that kind of like all feed into <laughs> what mm-hmm. comes out of my brain. <laughs> So let's talk movie. You hinted at it a little bit ago. Um, Amazon and Greg Berlanti picked this up before, you know, again, before it's even published out to the world. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) What was your reaction when you first heard that that was a done deal? Well, I mean, it was like, it was like so many stages of reaction because like what people don't see behind the scenes is that like the process is, is crazy. Like uh, it starts with like, you know, I have a Hollywood agent and she sends out to people and then like one producer expresses interest and then um, more producers can if they want to. And then it turns into like, you're on the phone with like, you know, such and such from whatever like huge production company. And it's like, uh, I'm not qualified to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk to those and you pick your producer and that's how I picked Berlanti. Um, and I, I was just like really excited to, to, with, to even have the chance to work with them. Um, because I've loved so much of their work, like not even just looking at like Love, Simon, like going back to like Political Animals, which is like like a six episode series that's on Netflix. It's got, it's honestly, um, I would say one of my touchstones too, because uh, it's got like a, a, like Sigourney Weaver is the president in that, um, which is just like amazing. And they've got like Sebastian Stan as like one of the president's kids. And he's like very like tortured and like, recovery from addiction and he's gay and he's he's Sebastian Stan so he's crying you know (laughs) and like very beautiful and um but yeah so I just like I knew that he had the range for it you know and I also knew that based on Love, Simon that he had that like that production company had the chops to get a like an unapologetically queer rom-com into the mainstream you know um but also it was like for on a personal level, I just remember going to see Love, Simon in the theater. And that was like probably a week after I signed my book deal. And I like showed up with like an entire eight inch Jimmy John sub in my purse because I, like I knew I was going to cry and I like to eat my feelings. (laughs) So, so it was like literally me like alone. I had to like drive like 15 minutes out of my city because I was living in Louisiana at the time. Uh, to find a theater that was playing it. And it was just like me alone in the theater with my sandwich, just like weeping to Jennifer Garner, you know? Um, and I just remember getting in my car and thinking like, if I, if my book could make people feel half as seen as I just felt, you know, by watching that movie, then I will be so, so happy. And so to have the chance to, to do some, to do, to kind of pay forward what that feeling was for me to like the next round of people, um, especially queer people like meant so much to me. And then, yeah, Amazon, um, they just like care so much about the project. They're so passionate about it. They like, they want it to, you know, really, they're actually like really invested in diversifying, um, what is in the market and, um, and, and taking some risks and doing things like this, like that project like this. Um, and it's just like so incredibly like mind blowing and it really doesn't feel real yet to have people want to invest that kind of like those kinds of resources in a story that I wrote that just like came out of my brain. Um, it's just more than anything, I'm just so excited about what it could represent and what it could mean to people. Um, I think about like, and not to at all compare the histories of these communities but i think about like black panther and crazy rich asians and like what those movies meant to have this big cinematic event Mm -hmm. geared around a demographic that wasn't usually like catered to by the mainstream you know and what it meant for those people and and you know 
what it represented for the future of storytelling for different groups. Um, and I like the idea of like being able to make, you know, any kind of similar impact with movie is incredible. Um, and I really hope that we can do that. And I really hope that it can be um, the beginning of a lot more queer rom-coms, you know? So yeah, it's amazing. I'm like so, so humbled and amazed and really excited to see what comes next with it. As you were writing, I think all authors tend to cast their books to some degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have in mind, and knowing this is totally separate from anything that Amazon and Berlanti might do, sure, do you sure. have in mind who Alex and uh, and Henry are, at least in your head as you were writing, if you had to assign well, them like, an actor? Well, like, it's so hard because, and this is like kind of an indictment of, you know, the state of Hollywood, you know, and that is slowly being a change, but there really aren't a lot of like young Latino actors out there to choose from. You know, and so it was like there really wasn't a definitive Alex in my head because I had looked and looked and it was like so hard to find, you know, someone that that fit. And that's what's exciting to me about the movie is I think that we will get a chance to kind of give a star making role to, you know, like some young unknown Latino actor, um, which would be amazing. And I would love to do that. Um, and it was and, and Henry is just very elusive. Like there's like five million charming white British men but uh, but he's just like in my head he's just like so specific looking and like I have not yet found anyone that matched him but the, the parts that were like easiest for me to like assign an actor to were like like I, I always pictured like Daniel Day Lewis as Richards um mm. like with like but like Silver Foxy you know um and then like Ellen Claremont in my head from day one has been Connie Britton and then like I mean like Raphael Luna, like in my head, is like Oscar Isaac for sure, you know. Oh, um, yeah, I like yeah, that, right? <laughs> right? Like, there are some characters that like I came up with the character first and then like tried to figure out what they looked like, and there are other characters where, like, with Raphael Luna, I was like, I want a character who looks like Oscar Isaac, what's he gonna be, <laughs> you know? Um, and and that was kind of how that came to be, but yeah, I'm really excited, like, casting is gonna be so much fun, and I'm very excited about it, and I'm really, really excited about um about just like getting to see you know what we can do for some like I think there's gonna be a lot of like unknowns in it in like the lead roles and that's gonna be amazing because they're gonna be able to just really step into and embody those characters without it being like distracting like oh that's like so and so you know like I just like I look at them and all I see is like the character they played in Game of Thrones or whatever right um you know so I think that'll be you know a fun thing but yeah <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of it for that. Do you, we get to see more of Alex and Henry in the future, do you think? Mm -hmm. I think that that... Uh, I would not rule that out. Um, that's all I can really say about that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I think that uh, that would be amazing. I would love to do that. And you mentioned your next book is going to be uh, a female pairing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's completely different from this. It's like a much smaller scope of a world. Like it's just like a girl who moves to New York and um, she's she's from the South. I, I don't think I will. I don't know if I will ever write a protagonist that's not from the South because that's just like so deeply ingrained in me and in my voice. But um, she's from the South. She moves to New York um, and she kind of like stumbles into this like roommate situation, um, where it's just like a sort of like ragtag band of misfits kind of thing. Um, and she develops this huge crush on this like hot chick who's on her subway commute every day. Um, and it's kind of like based on the idea of like what, like that, that, that way that you fall in love with somebody on public transit for like 20 minutes. And then it's like, you step off and it's like, they never existed anywhere other than the train. It's just like, they're just like, they're there for 20 minutes and you never see them again. And it's like, you know, but the thing is that she sees this girl every single time she's on the train and there's kind of a twist as to, um, I will say there's, there's some light, um, rom com -y style time travel shenanigans um, that happen. And um, the girl on the train is not exactly everything that she seems. Um, and so the whole book is about like them, like their relationship, but at the same time trying to figure out what's going on with this girl. 
Um, so, but it's, and it's a rom-com and it's super fun. And of course it has a gratuitous karaoke moment. Excellent. Except it's like, well, it's, it's more of like, well, no, there's, there's a gratuitous karaoke moment and there's a gratuitous drag show moment. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, range, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm hoping, I mean, obviously we haven't set a date for it yet. We, um, but uh, it is super, super like personal and like a book of my heart for me. And I'm really excited for people to read it. Fantastic. Definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be awesome. I'm excited. What's the best way for folks to keep up with you online so they could track your, your progress with the, with what's up with <laughs> Alex and Henry and also the new book and everything sure. else? Yeah, um, Twitter for sure. Um, I've kind of been taking a step back lately because since we announced the movie, um, my notifications have been like busted, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll definitely be back on more, like especially during tour. Um, I, I tweet out like playlists and like a lot of like little like trivial information, like, um, like there's, like birth charts and things like that um on there and then also instagram um that one is more like for like you know i'm here for this tour date you know kind of thing um so yeah those are like my big two and it's like it's like casey underscore mcquiston on twitter and then casey period mcquiston on instagram very cool well we will put the links to all of that in the show notes (laughs) thank Uh, you so much i appreciate it (laughs) Red, White, and Royal Blue comes out on May 14th, and we wish you just continued success, because it's been so much already, and and look forward to seeing the movie and and everything else that comes from it. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so, so grateful. Um, It's been so much fun, so thank you so much for having me on. 